Right, so hello and welcome back to Books and Things and welcome to another Jane Austen July video. And today I'm going to be doing a reading for you from one of Jane Austen's pieces of Juvenilia, which is called Jack and Alice. So, mostly this video is just going to be me reading Jack and Alice. Um, as you know, if you're taking part in Jane Austen July, one of our read-alongs for this Jane Austen July is to read a piece of Jane Austen's Juvenalia every day in the second half of July. Um, and my favourite piece of Jane Austen's Juvenalia is Jack and Alice. I think Jack and Alice is hilarious and joyous um, and very odd. So I thought I would read aloud for you today, Jack and Alice, and that will just be the rest of the video. So I hope you enjoy this, like a little audiobook from me, um, and hopefully this is kind of fun. It's not very long, so hopefully you can enjoy Jack and Alice. Jack and Alice, a novel. It's respectfully inscribed to Francis William Austin Esquire, midshipman on board His Majesty's ship the Perseverance, by his obedient, humble servant, the author. Chapter the First Mr Johnson was once upon a time about fifty-three. In a twelve-month afterwards he was fifty-four, which so much delighted him that he was determined to celebrate his next birthday by giving a masquerade to his children and friends. Accordingly, on the day he attained his fifty-fifth year, tickets were dispatched to all his neighbours to that purpose. His acquaintance, indeed, in that part of the world were not very numerous, as they consisted only of Lady Williams, Mr and Mrs Jones, Charles Adams and the three Miss Simpsons, who composed the neighbourhood of Pammy Diddle and formed the masquerade. Before I proceed to give an account of the evening, it will be proper to describe to my reader the persons and characters of the party introduced to his acquaintance. Mr and Mrs Jones were both rather tall and very passionate, but were in other respects good-tempered, well-behaved people. Charles Adams was an amiable, accomplished and bewitching young man, of so dazzling a beauty that none but eagles could look him in the face. Miss Simpson was pleasing in her person, in her manners and her disposition, and unbounded ambition was her only fault. Her second sister, Suki, was envious, spiteful and malicious, her person was short, fat and disagreeable. Cecilia, the youngest, was perfectly handsome, but too affected to be pleasing. In Lady Williams, every virtue met. She was a widow with a handsome jointure and remains of a very handsome face. Though benevolent and candid, she was generous and sincere. Though pious and good, she was religious and amiable. Though elegant and agreeable, she was polished and entertaining. The Johnsons were a family of love, and though a little addicted to the bottle and the dice, had many good qualities. Such was the party assembled in the elegant drawing room of Johnson Court, amongst which the pleasing figure of a sultana was the most remarkable of the female masks. Of the males, a mask representing the sun was the most universally admired. The beams that darted from his eyes were like those of the glorious luminary, though infinitely superior. So strong were they that no one dared venture within half a mile of them. He had therefore the best part of the room to himself, its size not amounting to more than three quarters of a mile in length and half a one in breadth. The gentleman at last finding the fierceness of his beams to be very inconvenient to the concourse by obliging them to crowd together in one corner of the room, half shut his eyes, by which means the company discovered him to be Charles Adams in his plain green coat without any mask at all. When their astonishment was a little subsided, their attention was attracted by two dominoes who advanced in a horrible passion, though both very tall, but seemed in other respects to have many good qualities. These, said the witty Charles, are Mr. and Mrs. Jones, and so indeed they were. No one could imagine who was the Sultana, till at length her addressing a beautiful Flora who was reclining in a studied attitude on a couch with, Oh, Cecilia, I wish I was really what I pretend to be. She was discovered by the never-failing genius of Charles Adams to be the elegant but ambitious Caroline Simpson, and the person to whom she addressed herself, he rightly imagined to be her lovely but affected sister. Cecilia. The company now advanced to a gaming table where sat three dominoes, each with a bottle in their hand, deeply engaged. But a female in the character of Virtue fled with hasty footsteps from the shocking scene, while the little fat woman representing Envy sat alternatively on the foreheads of the three gamesters. 
Charles Adams was still as bright as ever. He soon discovered the party at play to be the three Johnsons, Envy to be Suki Simpson and Virtue to be Lady Williams. The masks were then all removed and the company retired to another room to partake of an elegant and well-managed entertainment, after which, the bottle being pretty briskly pushed about by the three Johnsons, the whole party were carried home dead drunk. Chapter the Second for three months did the masquerade afford ample subject for conversation to the inhabitants of Pammy Diddle, but no character at it was so fully expatiated on as Charles Adams. The singularity of his appearance, the beam which darted from his eyes, the brightness of his wit, and the whole tout ensemble of his person had subdued the hearts of so many of the young ladies that of the six present at the masquerade, but five have returned uncaptivated. Alice Johnson was the unhappy sixth whose heart had not been able to withstand the power of his charms, but as it may appear strange to my readers that so much worth and excellence as he possessed should have conquered only hers, it will be necessary to inform them that the Miss Simpsons were defended from his power by ambition, envy and self-admiration. Every wish of Caroline was centred on a titled husband, whilst in Suki each superior excellence could only raise her envy, not her love and Cecilia was too tenderly attached to herself to be pleased with anyone besides. As for Lady Williams and Mrs Jones, the former of them was too sensible to fall in love with one so much her junior, and the latter, though very tall and passionate, was too fond of her husband to think of such a thing. Yet in spite of every endeavour on the part of Miss Johnson to discover any attachment to her in him, the cold and indifferent heart of Charles Adams still to all appearance preserved its native freedom, polite to all but partial to none. He still remained the lovely, the lively, but insensible Charles Adams. One evening, Alice, finding herself somewhat heated by wine, no very uncommon case, determined to seek a relief for her disordered head and lovesick heart in the conversation of the intelligent Lady Williams. She found her ladyship at home, as was in general the case, for she was not fond of going out, and like the great Sir Charles Grandison, scorned to deny herself when at home, as she looked on that fashionable method of shutting out disagreeable visitors as little less than downright bigamy. In spite of the wine she had been drinking, poor Alice was uncommonly out of spirits. She could think of nothing but Charles Adams, she could talk of nothing but him, and in short spoke so openly that Lady Williams soon discovered the unreturned affection she bore him, which excited her pity and compassion so strongly that she addressed her in the following manner. I perceive but too plainly, my dear Miss Johnson, that your heart has not been able to withstand the fascinating charms of this young man, and I pity you sincerely. Is it first love? It is. I am still more grieved to hear that. I am myself a sad example of the miseries in general advent on first love, and am determined for the future to avoid the like misfortune. I wish it may not be too late for you to do the same. If it is not, endeavour, my dear girl, to secure yourself from so great a danger. A second attachment is seldom attended with any serious consequences. Against that, therefore, I have nothing to say. Preserve yourself from a first love, and you need not fear a second. You mentioned, madam, something of your having yourself been a sufferer by the misfortune you are so good as to wish me to avoid. Will you favour me with your life and adventures? Withingly, my love. Chapter the Third My father was a gentleman of considerable fortune in Berkshire, myself and a few more his only children. I was but six years old when I had the misfortune of losing my mother, and being at that time young and tender, my father, instead of sending me to school, procured an able-handed governess to superintend my education at home. My brothers were placed in schools suitable to their ages, and my sisters, being all younger than myself, remained under the care of their nurse. Miss Dickens was an excellent governess. She instructed me in the paths of virtue. Under her tuition, I daily became more amiable and might perhaps by this time have nearly attained perfection had not my worthy preceptress been torn from my arms ere I had attained my 17th year. I shall never forget her last words. My dear Kitty, she said, good night to you. I never saw her afterwards, continued Lady Williams, wiping her eyes. She eloped with the butler the same night. I was invited the following year by a distant relation of my father's to spend the winter with her in town. 
Mrs Watkins was a lady of fashion, family and fortune. She was, in general, esteemed a pretty woman, but I never thought her very handsome for my part. She had too high a forehead, her eyes were too small, and she had too much colour. How can that be? interrupted Miss Johnson, reddening with anger. Do you think that anyone can have too much colour? Indeed I do, and I'll tell you why I do, my dear Alice. When a person has too great a degree of red in their complexion, it gives their face, in my opinion, too red a look. But can a face, my lady, have too red a look? Certainly, my dear Miss Johnson, and I'll tell you why. When a face has too red a look, it does not appear to so much advantage as it would were it paler. Pray, madam, proceed with your story. Well, as I said before, I was invited by this lady to spend some weeks with her in town. Many gentlemen thought her handsome, but in my opinion, her forehead was too high, her eyes too small, and she had too much colour. In that, madam, as I said before, your ladyship must have been mistaken. Mrs. Watkins could not have had too much colour, since nobody can have too much. Excuse me, my love, if I do not agree with you in that particular. Let me explain myself clearly. My idea of the case is this. When a woman has too great a proportion of red in her cheeks, she must have too much colour. But, madam, I deny that it is possible for anyone to have too great a proportion of red in their cheeks. What, my love, if they have too much colour? Miss Johnson was now out of all patience, the more so, perhaps, as Lady William still remained so inflexibly cool. It must be remembered, however, that her ladyship had, in one respect, by far the advantage of Alice. I mean in not being drunk, for, heated with wine and raised by passion, she could have little command of her temper. The dispute at length grew so hot on the part of Alice that, from words, she almost came to blows. But Mr Johnson luckily entered, and with some difficulty forced her away from Lady Williams, Mrs Watkins, and her red cheeks. Chapter the Fourth My readers may perhaps imagine that after such a fracas, no intimacy could longer subsist between the Johnsons and Lady Williams, but in that they are mistaken, for her ladyship was too sensible to be angry at a conduct which she could not help perceiving to be the natural consequence of inebriety, and Alice had too sincere a respect for Lady Williams, and too great a relish for her claret, not to make every concession in her power. A few days after their reconciliation, Lady Williams called on Miss Johnson to propose a walk in a citron grove, which led from her ladyship's pigsty to Charles Adams's horse pond. Alice was too sensible of Lady Williams' kindness in proposing such a walk, and too much pleased with the prospect of seeing at the end of it a horse pond of Charles Adams, not to accept it with visible delight. They had not proceeded far when she was roused from the reflection of the happiness she was going to enjoy by Lady Williams thus addressing her. I have as yet forborne, my dear Alice, to continue the narrative of my life from an unwillingness of recalling to your memory a scene which, since it reflects on you rather disgrace than credit, had better be forgot than remembered. Alice had already begun to colour up, and was beginning to speak, when her ladyship, perceiving her displeasure, continued thus. I am afraid, my dear girl, that I have offended you by what I have just said. I assure you, I do not mean to distress you by a retrospection of what cannot now be helped. Considering all things, I do not think you so much to blame as many people do, for when a person is in liquor, there is no answering for what they may do. Madam, this is not to be borne. I insist... My dear girl, don't vex yourself about the matter. I assure you I have entirely forgiven everything respecting it. Indeed, I was not angry at the time, because I, as I saw all along, you were nearly dead drunk. I knew you could not help saying the strange things you did, but I see I distress you. So I will change the subject and desire it may never again be mentioned. Remember, it is all forgot. I will now pursue my story, but I must insist upon not giving you any description of Mrs. Watkins. It would only be reviving old stories. And as you never saw her, it can be nothing to you if her forehead was too high, her eyes were too small, or if she had too much colour. Again, Lady Williams, this is too much. So provoked was poor Alice at this renewal of the old story that I do not know what might have been the consequence of it had not their attention been engaged by another subject, a lovely young woman lying apparently in great pain beneath a citron tree was an object too interesting not to attract their notice. Forgetting their own dispute, they both, with sympathising tenderness, advanced towards her and accosted her in these terms. 
You seem, fair nymph, to be labouring under some misfortune, which we should be happy to relieve if you will inform us what it is. Will you favour us with your life and adventures? Willingly, ladies, if you will be so kind as to be seated. They took their places, and thus she began. Chapter the Fifth I am a native of North Wales, and my father is one of the most capital tailors in it. Having a numerous family, he was easily prevailed on by a sister of my mother's, who is a widow in good circumstances and keeps an alehouse in the next village to ours, to let her take me and breed me up at her own expense. Accordingly, I have lived with her for the last eight years of my life, during which time she provided me with some of the first-rate masters, who taught me all the accomplishments requisite for one of my sex and rank. Under their instructions, I learned dancing, music, drawing, and various languages, by which means I became more accomplished than any other tailor's daughter in Wales. Never was there a happier creature than I was till within this last half year. But I should have told you before that the principal estate in our neighbourhood belongs to Charles Adams, the owner of that brick house you see yonder. Charles Adams? exclaimed the astonished Alice. Are you acquainted with Charles Adams? To my sorrow, madam, I am. He came about half a year ago to receive the rents of the estate I have just mentioned. At that time I first saw him. As you see, ma'am, acquainted with him, I need not describe to you how charming he is. I could not resist his attractions. Ah, who can? said Alice with a deep sigh. My aunt, being in terms of the greatest intimacy with his cook, determined at my request to try whether she could discover, by means of her friend, if there were any chance of his returning my affection. For this purpose, she went one evening to drink tea with Mrs. Susan, who in the course of conversation mentioned the goodness of her place and the goodness of her master, upon which my aunt began pumping her with so much dexterity that in a short time Susan owned that she did not think her master would ever marry. For, said she, he has often and often declared to me that his wife, whoever she might be, must possess youth, beauty, birth, wit, merit and money. I have many a time, she continued, endeavoured to reason with him out of his resolution and to convince him of the improbability of his ever meeting with such a lady, but my arguments have had no effect, and he continues as firm in his determination as ever. You may imagine, ladies, my distress on hearing this, for I was fearful that, though possessed of youth, beauty, wit, and merit, and though the probable heiress of my aunt's house and businesses, he might think me deficient in rank, and in being so, unworthy of his hand. However, I was determined to make a bold push, and therefore wrote him a very kind letter, offering him with great tenderness my hand and heart. To this I received an angry and peremptory refusal, but thinking it might be rather the effect of his modesty than anything else, I pressed him again on the subject, but he never answered any more of my letters, and very soon afterwards left the country. As soon as I heard of his departure, I wrote to him here, informing him that I should shortly do myself the honour of waiting on him at Pammy Diddle, to which I received no answer. Therefore, choosing to take silence for consent, I left Wales, unknown to my aunt, and arrived here after a tedious journey this morning. On inquiring for his house, I was directed through this wood, the one you see here, with a heart elated by the expected happiness of beholding him, I entered it and had proceeded thus far in my progress through it, when I found myself suddenly seized by the leg, and, on examining the cause of it, found that I had caught in one of the steel traps so common in gentlemen's grounds. Ah, cried Lady Williams, how fortunate we are to meet with you, since we might otherwise perhaps have shared the like misfortune. It is indeed happy for you, ladies, that I should have been a short time before you, I screamed, as you may easily imagine, till the woods resounded again, until one of the inhuman wretched servants came to my assistance and released me from my dreadful prison, but not before one of my legs was entirely broken. Chapter the Sixth At this melancholy recital, the fair eyes of Lady Williams were suffused in tears, and Alice could not help exclaiming, "'Oh, cruel Charles, to wound the hearts and legs of all the fair!' Lady Williams now interposed and observed that the young lady's leg ought to be set without farther delay. After examining the fracture, therefore, she immediately began and performed the operation with great skill, which was the more wonderful on account of her never having performed such a one before. Lucy then arose from the ground and, finding that she could walk with the greatest ease, accompanied them to Lady Williams' house at her ladyship's particular request. 
the perfect form, the beautiful face and elegant manners of Lucy so won on the affections of Alice that when they parted, which was not till after supper, she assured her that, except her father, brother, uncles, aunts, cousins and other relations, Lady Williams, Charles Adams and a few dozen or more or particular friends, she loved her better than almost any other person in the world. Such a flattering assurance of her regard would justly have given much pleasure to the object of it had she not plainly perceived that the amiable Alice had partaken too freely of Lady William's claret. Her ladyship, whose discernment was great, read in the intelligent countenance of Lucy her thoughts on the subject, and as soon as Miss Johnson had taken her leave, thus addressed her. When you are more intimately acquainted with my dear Alice, you will not be surprised, Lucy, to see the dear creature drink a little too much, for such things happen every day. She has many rare and charming qualities, but sobriety is not one of them. The whole family are indeed a sad, drunken set. I am sorry to say, too, that I never knew three such thorough gamesters as they are, more particularly Alice, but she is a charming girl. I fancy not one of the sweetest tempers in the world, to be sure I have seen her in such a passion. However, she is a sweet young lady. I am sure you'll like her. I scarcely know anyone so amiable. Oh, that you could have but seen her the other evening. How she raved, and on such a trifle, too. She is indeed a most pleasing girl. I shall always love her. She appears by your ladyship's account to have so many good qualities, replied Lucy. Oh, a thousand, answered Lady Williams, though I am very partial to her, and perhaps am blinded by my affection to her real defects. Chapter the Seventh the next morning brought the three Miss Simpsons to wait on Lady Williams, who received them with the utmost politeness and introduced to their acquaintance Lucy, with whom the eldest was so much pleased that at parting she declared her sole ambition was to have her accompany them the next morning to Bath, whither they were going for some weeks. Lucy, said Lady Williams, is quite at her own disposal, and if she chooses to accept so kind an invitation, I hope she will not hesitate from any motives of delicacy on my account. I know not indeed how I shall ever be able to part with her. She never was at Bath, and I should think that it would be a most agreeable jaunt to her. Speak, my love, she continued, turning to Lucy. What say you to accompanying these ladies? I shall be miserable without you. It will be a most pleasant tour to you. I hope you'll go. If you do, I am sure it will be the death of me. Pray be persuaded. Lucy begged leave to decline the honour of accompanying them with many expressions of gratitude for the extreme politeness of Miss Simpson in inviting her. Miss Simpson appeared much disappointed by her refusal. Daly Williams insisted on her going, declared that she would never forgive her if she did not, and, in short, used such persuasive arguments that it was at length resolved she was to go. The Miss Simpsons called for her at ten o'clock the next morning, and Lady Williams had soon the satisfaction of receiving from her young friend the pleasing intelligence of their safe arrival in Bath. It may now be proper to return to the hero of this novel, the brother of Alice, of whom I believe I have scarcely ever had occasion to speak, which may perhaps be partly owing to his unfortunate propensity to liquor, which so completely deprived him of the use of those faculties nature had endowed him with that he never did anything worth mentioning. His death happened a short time after Lucy's departure and was the natural consequence of this pernicious practice. By his decease, his sister became the sole inheritress of a very large fortune which, as it gave her fresh hopes of rendering herself acceptable as a wife to Charles Adams, could not fail of being most pleasing to her, and as the effect was joyful, the cause could scarcely be lamented. Finding the violence of her attachment to him daily augment, she at length disclosed to her father and desired him to propose a union between them to Charles. Her father consented and set out one morning to open the affair to the young man. Mr. Johnson being a man of few words, his part was soon performed, and the answer he received was as follows. Sir, I may perhaps be expected to appear pleased and grateful for the offer you have made me, but let me tell you that I consider it as an affront. I look upon myself to be, sir, a perfect beauty. Where would you see a finer figure or a more charming face? Then, sir, I imagine my manners and address to be of the most polished kind. There is a certain elegance, a peculiar sweetness in them that I never saw equalled and cannot describe. Partiality aside, I am certainly more accomplished in every language, every science, every art and everything than any other person in Europe. 
My temper is even, my virtues innumerable, myself unparalleled. Since such, sir, is my character, what do you mean by wishing me to marry your daughter? Let me give you a short sketch of yourself and of her. I look upon you, sir, to be a very good sort of man in the main. A drunken old dog, to be sure, but that's nothing to me. Your daughter, sir, is neither sufficiently beautiful, sufficiently amiable, sufficiently witty, nor sufficiently rich for me. I expect nothing more in my wife than my wife shall find in me. Perfection. These, sir, are my sentiments, and I honour myself for having such. One friend I have, and glory in having but one. She is at present preparing my dinner, but if you choose to see her, she shall come, and she will inform you that these have ever been my sentiments. Mr. Johnson was satisfied, and expressing himself to be much obliged to Mr. Adams for the characters he had favoured him with of his daughter and himself, took his leave. The unfortunate Alice, on receiving from her father the sad account of the ill success his visit had been attended with, could scarcely support the disappointment. She flew to her bottle, and it was soon forgot. While these affairs were transacting at Pammy Diddle, Lucy was conquering every heart in Bath. A fortnight's residence there had nearly effaced from her remembrance the captivating form of Charles, the recollection of what her heart had formerly suffered by his charms and her leg by his trap enabled her to forget him with tolerable ease, which was what she determined to do, and for that purpose dedicated five minutes in every day to the employment of driving him from her remembrance. Her second letter to Lady Williams contained the pleasing intelligence of her having accomplished her undertaking to her entire satisfaction. She mentioned in it also an offer of marriage she had received from the Duke of Blank, an elderly man of noble fortune whose ill health was the chief inducement of his journey to Bath. I am distressed, she continued, to know whether I mean to accept him or not. There are a thousand advantages to be derived from a marriage with the Duke, for besides those more inferior ones of rank and fortune, it will procure me a home, which of all things is what I most desire. Your ladyship's kind wish of my always remaining with you is noble and generous, but I cannot think of becoming so great a burden on one I so much love and esteem. That one should receive obligations only from those we despise is a sentiment instilled into my mind by my worthy aunt in my early years and cannot, in my opinion, be too strictly adhered to. The excellent woman of whom I now speak is, I hear, too much incensed with my imprudent departure from Bath to receive me again. I most earnestly wish to leave the ladies I am now with. Miss Simpson is, indeed, setting aside ambition, very amiable, but her second sister, the envious and malevolent Suki, is too disagreeable to live with. I have reasons to think that the admiration I have met with in the circles of the great of this place has raised her hatred and envy, for often she has threatened and sometimes endeavoured to cut my throat. Your ladyship will therefore allow that I am not wrong in wishing to leave Bath and in wishing to have a home to receive me when I do, I shall expect with impatience your advice concerning the Duke, and am your most obliged, etc, etc, Lucy. Lady Williams sent her her opinion on the subject in the following manner. Why do you hesitate, my dearest Lucy, a moment with respect to the Duke? I have inquired into his character and find him to be an unprincipled, illiterate man. Never shall my Lucy be united with such a one. He has a princely fortune, which is every day increasing. How nobly will you spend it? What credit you will give him in the eyes of all? How much will he be respected on his wife's account? But why, my dearest Lucy, why will you not at once decide this affair by returning to me and never leaving me again? Although I admire your noble sentiments with respect to obligations yet let me beg that they may not prevent your making me happy it will to be sure be a great expense to me to have you always with me i shall not be able to support it but what is that in comparison with the happiness i shall enjoy in your society to ruin me i know you will not therefore surely withstand these arguments or refuse to return to yours most affectionately etc etc c williams chapter the ninth what might have been the effect of her ladyship's advice, had it ever been received by Lucy, is uncertain, as it reached Bath a few hours after she had breathed her last. She fell a sacrifice to the envy and malice of Suki, who, jealous of her superior charms, took her by poison from an admiring world at the age of seventeen. 
Thus fell the amiable and lovely Lucy, whose life had been marked by no crime and stained by no blemish but her imprudent departure from her arts, and whose death was sincerely lamented by everyone who knew her. Among the most afflicted of her friends were Lady Williams, Miss Johnson and the Duke, the last two of whom had a most sincere regard for her, more particularly Alice, who had spent a whole evening in her company and had never thought of her since. His grace's affliction may likewise be equally accounted for, since he lost one for whom he had experienced during the last ten days a tender affection and sincere regard. He mourned her loss with unshaken constancy for the next fortnight, at the end of which time he satisfied the ambition of Caroline Simpson by raising her to the rank of a duchess. Thus was she at length rendered completely happy in the gratification of her favourite passion. Her sister, the perfidious Suki, was likewise shortly after exalted in a manner she truly deserved, and by her actions appeared to have always desired. Her barbarous murder was discovered, and in spite of every interceding friend, she was speedily raised to the gallows. The beautiful but affected Cecilia was too sensible of her own superior charms, not to imagine that if Caroline could engage a duke, she might, without censure, aspire to the affections of some prince, and knowing that those of her native country were chiefly engaged, she left England, and I have since heard that she is at present the favourite sultana of the great Mongol. In the meantime, the inhabitants of Pamigiddle were in a state of the greatest astonishment and wonder, a report being circulated of the intended marriage of Charles Adams. The lady's name was still a secret. Mr. and Mrs. Jones imagined it to be Miss Johnson, but she knew better. All her fears were centred on his cook, when to the astonishment of everyone, he was publicly united to Lady Williams. The end. I really enjoy Jack and Alice. It's so silly, so nonsensical, so fun. And I really enjoy the way Jane Austen sort of like gently mocks um, other forms of stories. You know, the fact that characters are always like, will you tell me your life and adventures? Um, because, you know, in novels, um, characters often do tell people their whole life story for no apparent reason. Um, and, you know, I love the fact that Lady Williams just like um, mends Lucy's broken leg, which he definitely wouldn't be able to. I really enjoy the ending that Charles Adams ends up marrying Lady Williams. I like the fact that it's called Jack and Alice and Jack is barely in one paragraph. Um, and I just altogether think it is weird and delightful. So there we go. That's all for today. I hope you have enjoyed my reading of Jack and Alice. Thanks very much for watching. and I'll be back very soon with another bookish video.